John Maxwell tells a story of a, a room that was full of monkeys, had a bar in the middle of the room, and uh, what happened is the uh, people were going to do an experiment on these monkeys, so they went inside the room, the monkeys kind of scattered to the perimeter, and they put on top of that bar, there was a, a, a flat spot, and they put a, a, a batch of fresh ripe bananas, and then they left the room. Well, immediately, uh, the most dominant monkey made to the pole and started to climb the pole. But then the experiment began. They took a blast of water and literally blasted him off the pole. And then another monkey thought, well, I'm going to give it a shot. He got blasted off the pole until every single monkey in there had been blasted off the pole multiple times. And uh, they then gave up and they just decided they weren't going to do it. Well, actually, before they gave up, what happened was it was kind of an interesting twist. Um, they, they noticed that when another monkey would try, they, they didn't actually have to blast them anymore, that the other monkeys would actually pull them down. Isn't that interesting? And, and so the monkeys started pulling them down. Well, then they got to thinking, well, what if, what if we were to take uh, like one of these monkeys out and put a new monkey in who didn't experience the water, what would happen? So they did that. And he didn't know the system. He didn't understand what was going on. He went in, he saw the bananas, he shot to the pole, and the primates began to pull him down. And then they got to thinking, well, what if we switched another monkey and another monkey? Every new monkey did the exact same thing and all the other monkeys pulled them down. Until, and this is interesting, they got to where there were no monkeys left in the room that had ever been shot with a blast of water. And they still kept pulling down every monkey when they tried to climb the pole. It, it, it was the weirdest thing. Now, I don't know if you've ever heard this expression. In fact, let me, let me read it so I say it right. It's been said that if you say a lie, say a lie loud, uh, often enough, excuse me, loudly enough and long enough, it will become accepted as fact. That you will come to believe. Now, here's what I want to suggest. Um, we are all conditioned to believe certain things. We have all been told certain things. They've been passed on, as it were, generation to generation. And uh, you, you, you've heard it, I've heard it. It's the world in which we live. And we come to believe certain things are true and, and doable and certain things are not true and not doable. And, and we lose the ability to question even wh why, why do we believe this stuff? What's going on? It, it seems like we would be smart to think and, and begin to wonder, are the things I've been told in my life, I mean, actually true? Uh, or, or are the things I've been told in my life actually not true? Uh, the big idea that I'm gonna wrestle with today is this idea right here. And in fact, if you have a journal and you're prone to write, now would be a great time to write this down. But I'm gonna say this a number of times because I want us to really wrestle with what this means. What you think, your thoughts affect your beliefs. Your thoughts affect your beliefs and your beliefs affect your actions, what you do. So what you think affects what you believe and what you believe affects what you ultimately do. And that is what we're gonna wrestle with. I, I believe that God has for all of us a better life than this world could ever give us. But I also believe that to reach that, we're gonna have to think differently than the world uh, that we live in thinks. So I'm gonna stop right here. I wanna say welcome. Welcome to all of you. Welcome to all of you with me here. Welcome to you on any of our campuses. Welcome. Uh, we're so glad you're here. We love you. We, you matter. You make a difference. We believe that life is better when we do it together. And... Uh, we, we just b believe that, you know, when we invest ourselves in each other's lives, uh, all of us win. So, hey, wherever you are, here, there, wherever, welcome. We're glad you're here. So we're continuing today a series that we started earlier in this month. It, it's called Money Talks. Money Talks. And money does talk, folks, and uh, all of us uh, kind of hear the things that it says. Now, I would say that some of the things that money has told you are, are true, and some of the things that money has told you are simply not true. You, you've heard a, a lot of things about money. But certain things get repeated over and over and over again. Certain lies get told over and over again. And pretty soon we just think they're true because we forgot to think and process and really, you know, kind of probe into it. So we're just thinking, we're, we're seeking to think differently than the, the world around us. And here's the deal. I, I want to hear from God. I want to hear from God. I, 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 I know what the world thinks about money. I want to know what God thinks about money. I want to understand, and I believe with all my heart, I believe that God understands money better than any human being has ever lived on this planet. I believe that with all my heart. I also believe 
that he wants to teach us what he understands about money. That the Bible is full of the wisdom of God if we would but listen and, and be willing to uh, absorb it and, and, and take it in, and I just believe that. Now, I also believe that if we could learn to think differently, we could live differently. Well, why do I believe that? Well, I believe that because your thoughts affect your beliefs, and, and your beliefs affect your actions, and I believe that living differently is exactly what God wants us to do. If you are just joining us uh, again here or wherever we are, uh, if you haven't heard the first couple of messages in the series, I, I'm gonna say, I seldom ever say this, but I would encourage you to go back and listen to them. Go listen to them because each of these messages is building on each other and you'll understand this when it all comes together. But we're trying to get an understanding and it's important. Now, uh, because some of you might not have been here and because it's been a couple of weeks because we interrupted the series last weekend, I wanna just go back and I just wanna remind you of a couple of the high points that we've already covered. You see, when I say money talks, some of the things it says are true and some of the things it says are not true, we're specifically trying to focus in and expose the lies that money tells. So we're kind of building this around lies that need to be exposed. So the first lie was week one, that talking money is taboo. We have all been taught that it's not proper, it's rude, it's inappropriate, it's taboo to actually bring money up in a conversation. You, you see this all, we, we do this because we believe that money is personal and it's private and it's nobody's business but our own and I challenge you to take that argument to the IRS. You go tell them they have no business knowing your income, how you got it and what you did with it. You, it doesn't work. I, I've also said this, that many times it's money that destroys relationships. You see this in, in a relationship, somebody's getting started in a relationship, they're dating, you come to that point, and then there's that, should I tell them, should I not tell them, I, you know, I'm deeply in debt, do I need it, what will it do? And we don't tell. You see it in marriages, and I've said this before, that I think one of the, uh, one of, if not the greatest destroyer of marriages, whatever you think it is, is money. It's disagreements over money and how it ought to be spent, how it ought to be you know, allocated and all that kind of stuff. But behind it all is this thing, we just don't talk about it. And I've told you, Jesus talked about it, so we should talk about it. And a church that won't talk about what Jesus talked about isn't a church you ought to be attending. So we're gonna talk about it. And uh, in talking about it, sometimes it gets a little uncomfortable. Why does it get uncomfortable? I've told you why. Because we understand that money is personal and it's private. We get that, it's personal, it's private. It's nobody's business but my own. But here's why we hide behind it's personal and it's private. Be because money is valuable. Everybody here knows that. You know it, we know it. Everyone, it's valuable. And what you're willing to exchange your money for is something you thought was more valuable than money. Whenever you buy something, you exchange something valuable for something you believe is gonna bring you greater happiness, it's gonna do more for you than what the money itself did. This is why Jesus talked about it so much. And you might remember this passage in, in uh, Matthew 6, for where your treasure is, there your heart will be also. Jesus just knew the greatest competition now listen carefully, the greatest competition for devotion from you is, for God, is that thing which you spend your money on. Just let that sit there. The greatest competition for your heart's devotion is that thing that you think is more valuable than money. So, he talked about it, we're gonna talk about it. That was lie number one. Lie number two, we talked about a couple of weeks ago, is this, all I lack is a little bit more. We believe that money brings us happiness and we're not happy, so what's missing is just a little bit more money. I remember the first job I got, the first full-time job I got. I, I cannot believe how much money I got paid. I got paid more money to do this job than any job I had ever done in my life. I cannot believe it was my first salaried position. I was, it was so much, it was bank, man, I couldn't believe it. My first job, I'm gonna date myself here, my first job, I got paid $10,000 a year. Ten thousand. They pay me ten thousand dollars a year. It was unbelievable. It was so much money. I was so crazy loaded with money. I had more money than I'd ever had, and uh, it was it was awesome. But you know what happened when we were paid ten thousand dollars? You start going. You know, if you know, Lisa, if, if you know, if we could ever get, if I could ever, like, if get, if I could get a job somewhere somehow. I was crazy, but I believed that if I could get a job that would pay me $20,000 a year, everything we've ever wanted would be secure. Just $20,000 is all it would take, and you know how this is gonna go, right? So I get a job that pays $20,000 a year, and for a little while, like a week, 
You're like so grateful. And then you start thinking, you know what's missing? I just need a little bit more. And what's a little bit more? Two times what you make. When you ask people, what's it going to take to make you happy? Two times what you make. See, see the problem is $40,000 can't do for you what 20000 couldn't do for you, which 10000 couldn't do you. Money can't make you happy, but a little bit more would, all right? A little bit more would, which is why Solomon said this in the book of Ecclesiastes. Whoever loves money never has enough. Whoever loves wealth is never satisfied with their income. This too is meaningless. It's pointless. You're chasing your tail. But by the way, uh, researchers have discovered this. You can refute this if you want. It doesn't matter. Uh, but they've said that there is a correlation between money and happiness to a certain amount. And I'll tell you the amount they said. In other words, when you're below this number, as you work your way up to this number, every raise incrementally makes you a little bit happier up until the number. And the number is $75,000 annually. Now, no, no, you, you go 75, yeah, see, after 75,000, they've noticed that there is a sharp decline in diminishing returns of the happiness to increased income. So when you're making 10, 20 does make you, and 40 does make you, but once you pass 75, money, they're just saying what, what money could do for you, it's doing for you, and it's not gonna do any more the more that you make. Now, what, what matters to all of this is that what I want you to understand that I think the lie that money is telling you is that a little bit more will, will make, make you happy because you don't yet have enough and, and, and that you're actually, you're really poor. And, and, and see, once you start to believe you're really poor and listen carefully, you're gonna think like a poor person would think. You're gonna act like a poor, because what you think affects you believe, you believe your actions. You think like a poor person, you're gonna see life like a poor person. And, and like, I don't have, and you're going to start thinking, uh, you're going to fear is going to set in, a scarcity is going to set in, because you're thinking you're poor. The problem is, if you were with us two weeks ago, the problem is we're, folks, we're not what? We're not poor. We're, in fact, we're rich. <laughs> we're rich. We're, we're not just rich. We're, we're really rich. We're not just really rich. We're, what? I can't hear you. We are really, really rich. And you go, what are you talking about, preacher? We're not really, really rich. Oh, no, you are. You are. Yeah, you see, um, uh, uh, if you go to the globalrichlist.com, and again, I keep telling you that thing, go check this out for yourself. Folks, I'm telling you, if you make annually $32,400, $32,400, check it out, you are in the top 1% of all wage earners on the planet. You are rich. You're a one percenter. And by the way, by the way, if you, if you make $80,000, you are in the top 10% of the top 1%. You're incredibly rich. But we don't feel rich because we compare ourselves to somebody on the other side of where we are and we go, they are rich. But folks, we're rich. Now here, so here, here I guess I can say it this way, all right? I got some really, really good news for you all. You ready? You're rich. <laughs> Woo! Let it out, man, let it out. Just go, yeah, baby, I made it. One percenter, you're rich. But I got some really bad news for you. You're rich. What's that mean? Yeah. You're, you're, you're the rich ones. We're, we're, we, I mean, I'm in that too, but just we're, we're rich. Uh, and when you start to realize you're rich, you start to realize, if, especially if you, if you have faith in God, you start to realize that he who has been given much will be accountable for much. And folks, you, you've been given, as, a, as have I, you've been given so much. In fact, I, I would say this. If you're rich, and we are, if you're rich, if you're rich, you, you will face temptations that poor people won't face. Let, let me just show you a couple of them, all right? So uh, the richer we are, the more difficult, uh, just, it's more difficult to rely on God. You've experienced this probably in your own life. But like, like when you were young and you just got married and your refrigerator started making those weird noises, and you started going, oh, what if it goes out? And you began to fear what would happen if your refrigerator quit working or your air conditioner or your, or your, or your, your car broke and you had no money. What did you do? You got down on your knees. You said, oh, God, please help me. And there was a desperation. There was a humility. There was a dependence. You know what happens when you get rich? 
you start building up reserves. You, you have an emergency fund. This is all good stuff. I'm not against any of this. But what happens is, is you go, hey, if my refrigerator goes out, I got an emergency fund. I'll just replace my refrigerator. And you, you don't quite pray the same way because you don't have. See, this is, again, what Solomon was talking about. And this goes through the book of Proverbs. Uh, he said this, the wealth of the rich is their fortified city. They imagine it a wall too high to scale. In other words, I've got so much money, I'm good. I'm it's the weirdest thing. I'm going to talk about this more later. It's the weirdest thing. The more money we have, the less we think we need God. It's a weird inversion. Because we go, hey, man, you know, this wall, I put, I've got the security wall around me. And, uh, man, I'm good. And God is trying to go, oh, my goodness. Do not put your confidence in that wall. But we do that. So the richer we are, the more difficult it is to believe in God. Here's the second one. The richer we are, the greater the temptation to believe that we made it on our own. Yeah, we, <laughs> that's right. I'm a one percenter because I worked hard and I was diligent and, and, I, and I, st I stuck my nose to the grindstone. Here's the problem with this, okay? And I love America. I am so grateful to have born, be born here, but I had nothing to do with being born here. And I don't know how to tell you this, but you don't have anything to do with where you were born. That kind of isn't your decision. You just kind of inherit a decision somebody else made for you. But where you got born? See, see so if you go to the other 99%, and they look at you and they go, you guys are so rich. You know, the first thing they're going to associate with why you're rich, what is it? It's where you were born. You start easily taking credit for, yeah, I'll tell you what. I, 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 I'm a self-made man and, and I worked really hard and I deserved everything I had. And we don't want to admit that maybe we had some help by living in an incredible country like we live in. And that's a reality. So it's a temptation. I, I did this, which leads us to the third temptation. The richer we are, the greater the temptation to forget that God is good. God is good. God placed you in the family he placed you in. God placed you in the country you were born in. God did all that. God is good. See, this goes to, back to the book of Deuteronomy. The, and I wish I had time to read this. I just don't. In the book of Deuteronomy, God said, okay, look, here's the deal, folks. I'm going to lead you across the Jordan River into the land we're going to call the promised land. It's a land flowing with milk and honey. But here's the deal. When you get over there and you live in a nice house and you have big herds and everything's going great for you and you have all this stuff, he said, I'm warning you, do not forget where all this came from. It came from me. I'm the reason you're going to be blessed. We always forget this. We, we, we start to take the blessing and, 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 and we get kind of caught up and we believe, no, by, by the by the sweat of my brow and the work of my hands and my heart. That's the reason I have all this. And God says, you're going to forget me when, when you do that. And I'm telling you, it's going to be your downfall. And so we got to be aware of that. Here, here's, a, here's a fourth one, okay? The richer we are, the uh, greater the temptation to distraction. You know, it's really interesting about having so much. We have so much. You, you, you ever think about all the things that can block your pursuit of God? Like, for instance, you're, you're here. Thank you for being here. But you know, think about all the things you had to overcome just to get here. Man, you know there's a new movie showing over the Harkins? Do you know this new, the, uh, this new restaurant opened up? Do, do, you know, every weekend, we're faced with the temptation. Ditch church. Go to the lake, man. Ditch church. Go to the mountains. Ditch church. Go on vacation. Ditch church. Ditch church. Get your kids in, in a sports league, you know, uh, a soccer league, you know, a baseball league, or a volleyball league. All of these things come in and they start to block our pursuit of God. But poor people in other countries don't have these temptations. They just don't. They don't have so much. It's really easy to be so busy being blessed, we forgot to bless the blesser of our blessings. It's a temptation. And then there is the fifth one. Because finally, and this is the one that I'm going to spend the rest of the little bit of time I've got left, the greater... The richer we are, the greater the tendency to believe that what is mine is mine. What is mine is mine. That is, by the way, lie number three. What is mine is mine is also the title of this message if you want to write it down in your journal. Lie number three, what is mine is mine. Now, I want to explain something, okay? And this, I think this is universal. If you're a parent, and many of us are parents, okay? If you're a parent, when you have your, your child, you know, you have a baby, your baby's growing up and crawling and learning to talk. You desperately want the first word of your, come on, we own this, right? If you're a mom, you want the first word of your child to be 
Mama, mama. If you're a dad, you want it to be <laughs> dada, okay? But Jimmy Fallon, in fact, if you've ever seen this, it's comical. Jimmy Fallon wrote a book. All these questions, the answer to every one of them is dada. Okay, so you read this, dada, dada, dada. You get so used to hearing it, okay? I, I tried really hard on all of our grandkids. No, no, it's not mama, it's not, it's papa. It's papa. And we worked really, really hard. Caden was the first one who actually got it right. And he said, Papa, it was his first one. Got it on film, all right? <laughs> Papa, way to go, Caden, what a kid. <laughs> but here's the point. The tragedy is, is while that's what we want them to say, that's not usually the first word that they figure out with meaning behind it. The first word they figure out is a different word. It's not quite so family-oriented. It's not so, so generous. It's what word? <laughs> oh, you heard it. Mine. Mine becomes the very first word. And by the way, not only do they know the word, they know the actions that go behind the word. The actions that go behind the word say this is the thing, is this is mine. It's not just mine, it's mine. No, 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 it's. You gotta clutch it to your chest and you turn away from everybody else. It's emotion. Can you do this with me in your seat? You take it to your chest and you turn your back on everybody else. It's mine. All right, and you have to get a wine in your voice for the. See, it, what I'm saying, I want to be really, really clear. This water bottle is not yours. You might think it's yours. I'm going to be really clear. It's not yours. It's mine. Okay, and, and and this this is kind of a territorial thing, and so you keep your hands off my water because this is not yours. Don't even get the least bit interested in it. We we like to collect and we like to own and we have a disinclination to want to share, and you would think we would just get old enough that we would outgrow this. Right? So we start with mine. Okay, you think we outgrow this? Hey, parents, you got a teenager, try to take their cell phone away. <laughs> Just take your best shot at taking away their cell phone. You, I know you paid for it, and I know you pay the service for it. But there is this incredibly possessive thing that we all have. Now, what we do, so that we can be really clear, is we learn how to mark our name on everything. We write our name. This is a Sharpie, this is permanent ink, so you're clear. So I'm gonna write my name, Cal, on this, so you clearly understand mine, not yours. Mine, not yours. Okay, this is mine, it's got my name on it. Permanent ink, it's mine. You don't think we're serious about this? Folks, we live in a land that you buy a car, you buy a motorcycle, you buy an ATV, you buy, you go down the list, you're gonna get a title. Whose name is on that title becomes crucial because whose name is on that title is the owner of that thing. We live in a land which you can't buy a piece of property without getting a deed. What's on the deed? The name of the owner of the land. We live in a land of Sharpies and contracts. So we're really clear, mine, not yours. And we, as we live our life, we tend to collect, we want more and more stuff, and we want to make sure. But I want to just challenge you, what if... The whole idea of ownership is a lie. What if the whole idea of ownership is a delusion? What if it's something that we think is real, but actually is not real at all? I mean, think about it. Every single thing that you have used a Sharpie or used a legal contract to put your name on, every single thing that has your name on it today, one day in the future, will be in somebody else's name. Everything. Just think about it. Everything. You're over my dead body. Well, it will be over <laughs> your dead body. And everything is yours is going to become some. Everything you've spent your entire life exchanging what's valuable for what you thought was more valuable is going to go to somebody else. That was the whole point of the barns that we talked about a couple weeks ago. Um, no matter how long you live, no matter how you die, whatever you have your name on, is not going with you. Uh, you. You might remember the name John D. Rockefeller. Uh, Rockefeller was, in his day, the richest American. When Rockefeller died, something happened at his funeral. It's been passed down. He was being put into the ground. His accountant was standing there, and a, and a business associate was standing next to his accountant. The guy leaned over to Rockefeller's accountant and asked the question, how much did he leave? And the accountant leaned back over, all of it. All of it. And folks, that's how it's going to be for you. That's how it's going to be for me. So could it be a, uh, just an illusion? You, you know this verse. You've heard this probably from the time you were little. You've heard this verse. Job said it this way. 
everything was taken from him. He said, you know what? Naked I came. Like, he didn't die and everything was, everything was taken. He goes, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. He got it. That none of this stuff is really ever yours. You, you have a season in which you think it's yours, but it's not yours. It's kind of like this. You know, and I've talked about this before. Let me just remind you. The game of Monopoly. I, the game of Monopoly is a fascinating game. The game of Monopoly is incredibly fun for one person who's playing the game. Who's the one person? It's obvious. The one who's got all the stuff. And it is so fun. And you know what, ha you know what happens? People destroy relationships over the game of Monopoly, right? It's like, you are so mean, you are so cruel, and people can take weeks to get over it. Because it's like, I can't believe you. I can't believe the way you act. It, it, it's a picture of life. But you know what? Just say you won. Say you cleaned up. You destroyed the competition. Guess what? Now, now listen, all right? That game took probably three hours to play. It felt like a lifetime if it wasn't you that was winning. Uh, that game took three hours maybe to play. And you know what? When it's done, you know what happens? All your accomplishments, all your properties, all your wealth, don't miss what I'm about to say, go back into the box. They go back into the box. I don't mean to be blunt, but listen to me. If, if, if you consider me your pastor, let me tell you something pastoral. When it's all said and done, the game ain't going in the box. You are. <laughs> the game stays behind. You're going into a box. You work so hard for all of that. Yep. And it goes into a box. See, all of this is very simple. If you want to just listen to what God wants to inform us of, it gets so simple. Let me show you. Like, like Psalm 24, 1 says, the earth is the Lord's and everything in it, the world and all who lives in it. What does that mean? It means this is a joke to God. This is a, a delusion. I can write my name on anything and God just goes, you know, that's not really yours, right? No, no, it's mine. I wrote my name on it. It's mine. The, the Bible says that Everything is God's, and you and I have the privilege of being a trustee over his estate. What does that mean? It, was, it calls you and I a steward. A steward. Let me show you the definition of a steward. A person who manages another's property or financial affairs, one who administers anything as the agent of another or others. In, in other words, all it belongs to God, and God allows you a season of time in, in which you get to have the resource of some of his stuff. You, you, you get to have it in your hands. Now, you, you can write your name all over it, but God knows it's not yours. Can you imagine? Just go with me on this. Can you imagine? I came up to you and I asked you, hey, can I, can I borrow your car? Mine's broken. I need to go. And you go, oh, Pastor Cal, sure, I'd loan you my car. You know, oh, yeah. you, you loan me a car. What if you found out that when I got your car, I went straight to the DMV and I sought to take title of your car? Well, come on, go with me. You good? Yeah, Pastor Cal, you can have my car. Yeah, right. Okay, I don't know the world you're living in. Okay? <laughs> you go, what do you mean? And what if when, when, when I got done with my thing, you saw your car parked in the parking lot here at the church, and you came up to me and said, hey, Cal, can I get my keys back? And I go, oh, yeah, no. Kind of had it rekeyed. <laughs> can you imagine? What if I took your car, and I didn't like the color of your car, so I went down and paid to get it painted. I painted your car. What if I put, like, uh, you had your license plates, but I had them switched out. And not only did I switch out your license plate, you know the thing goes around your license plate? What if I put, go Kansas City Chiefs on your car? You good with that? You would look at me and you go, you dude are psycho. You are seriously messed up in the head. Now, let me ask you a question. If everything belongs to God and I go around and write my name on everything, who's psycho? It's a delusion. It's simply a delusion. I have it for a season. I don't have it forever. See, when you start to understand this, it changes what you do because you start to understand that it's his stuff and he's watching what you do with his stuff. He's watching what you do with his stuff. Now, listen carefully. Listen carefully. He's also watching what his stuff's doing to you. 
Now, get what I just said. He's watching what you do with his stuff, but he's also watching what his stuff is doing to you. And you know if it's doing you to you? You just run out. You got, you got like crazy writing your name on everything. He, oh, no, 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 I can't give you much. You lose perspective way too quick. You can't handle it. See, this is why it says this. Luke, Jesus said, whoever can be trusted with very little, you get a little in your hands, you handle it well, um, can also be trusted with much. You've passed the test. You, you don't write your name on what's not yours. You don't take title to what's not rightfully yours. You don't do that. And, and by the way, uh, if you can be trusted with much, uh, he'll give you much. And, and whoever's dishonest with very little, you cheat, you lie, you twist, you justify, you rationalize a little. Oh, you dishonest with very little. You're gonna, you, can't, you can't be trusted with much. And you wonder why God doesn't put more in your control. Well, because you've shown what it does to you. You go crazy with a Sharpie marker. Now, I want to say something, and then I want to show you something. I want to say this. Everything, now listen carefully, this is so important. Everything that is a part of God's will, like, you know, Jesus, you know, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Everything, God, but for us to do everything that you, you would want done on heaven, it was going to take a lot of resource. And everything that is required to do what God wanted us to do, he's resourced us to do. Everything. Everything. Everything that God wanted done on earth, he's given us the means to do. The problem is the Sharpie. We write our name on it, we put it in our bank account. We write our name on it, we put it in our portfolio. We write our name on it, we put it in our wallet, and we call it ours. And God goes, that, that was not given to you for that. That was given to you to accomplish something. So Paul, uh, understanding this, has a, a young guy he's mentoring, a guy named Timothy, and there's two books in your Bible, two letters to, to, that's written to this young man, Timothy, in which he's trying to go, look, if you want to pastor people, now listen carefully, if you want to love people, if you want to do what's right by people, you're going to need to listen when it comes to this subject because I need to tell you something, Timothy. I need, you to, I, I need to tell you what you need to tell them. Now let me show you this because this is going to shock you and this might upset you, but I'm just going to tell you, this is straight from, it's straight from the Bible. We're going to go to 1 Timothy. Paul said, we'll just read this, okay? Command, oh gosh, that's such a strong word. Command those who are rich in this present world, glad that's not me, uh, not to be arrogant or to put their hope in wealth, which is so uncertain, but to put their hope in God who richly provides us with everything for our enjoyment. Let's just hold it right there. Okay, who are we talking to? You need to talk to those who are rich in this present world. Well, I'm glad I'm not rich, right? Who is he talking to? Talking to us, folks. In this present world, you're a one percenter. You're the rich ones, and I'm included. We're clear, we are. So uh, he's talking to us. Now, I want you to see the very first word. The very first word, the word command. <laughs> when you hear the word command, what do you think of? Imperative. It's an imperative. Command. Command does not mean, hey, uh, hey Timothy, you might want to suggest to the folks. You might want to just I mean, like allude to them. You might want to like drop some hints. Command is clear. You lay it down. You don't back up. You don't flinch. You don't... You know, you, you don't wallow over this. You, you, you say this clearly. What are we supposed to say clearly? Bring the verse up. Command those who are rich in this present world, that would be us, quit being arrogant. Don't go there. I made this, this is mine, I'm all that. This is all mine, it's not God's. Or to put your hope in wealth. I have a big strong fortress around my portfolio, I'm good. I, nothing's going to, uh, nope, no, don't put your hope in what It was just so uncertain. But instead, command them, don't put, your, don't put your confidence in your stuff. Put your confidence in God. Put your hope in God, who richly provides us with all of this stuff. And for what purpose? For your enjoyment. God isn't going to, like, chew me out because he gave me the opportunity to manage a bottle of water. He's not going to, I mean, he's trusted me with this. So he's not going to chastise me for having it. But he's going to watch what I do with it. He's going to watch what it does to me and him. So command him to enjoy it. You can enjoy what God has entrusted you. Enjoy it. Now, if that was all the verse said, we'd be done. Put it done in there. We go on. 
Next two verses, there's the word again. Command them, okay, all right, I got more, I got more commands, all right? Here we go. Command them, you, y'all, do good with your stuff. Do good. Be rich in good deeds. Be over the top. Be a one percenter in your good deeds. And by the way, be generous and be willing to share. Okay, no more. Be generous and be willing to share. Now, I love this. I love this. Why would I want to do that? Oh, this is so good. This is so good. In this way, by doing that, being generous, willing to share, rich in good deeds, they, you, will lay up treasure for yourself as a firm foundation for the age to come. What, 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 what? Yeah, see, you're not in heaven yet, but the box is waiting, and, and you're gonna be transported, assuming all things go well, <laughs> and your wealth didn't screw up your, your head, you're gonna go to heaven, and you know what you could do with your wealth now? You could lay a foundation, a firm foundation for the day that's coming. What's that mean? God's watching what you do with this stuff. And he's watching what his stuff does to you. So take your stuff that's not yours. It's on loan to you from him. You're in a trustee, you're a steward. And lay a firm foundation by doing what he asked. Now watch this, watch this. So that, and I love, the, I love this. So that they may take hold. And this is one of my favorite verses in the Bible. So that they can take hold of the life that is truly life. What, no, what is, stop, what, what, are we talking about the future? It's like someday in eternity, I'm, I'm going to... Someday I'm going to have the life that is truly life because I laid a foundation in the future and I did the right thing. No, 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 no. You're missing it. The life that is truly life is the life you could live right now. You could live it right now. Let me explain. Let me explain. You can get the bananas. <laughs> you can get to the bananas. You can enjoy the bananas. But listen, you can't think like every other monkey that's running around you. You gotta think differently. You just got to think differently. Uh, folks, I wanna, I wanna close. I, I wanna explain just two things to you. I've already alluded to them. Let me just say them as clearly as I know how. Everything God wants done on this planet, he's given us the means to accomplish. So don't run around going, how come there's poverty? How come there's, you know, everything God wanted done, he's resourced. Now, you can disagree with that. It's all his. He, he's in control, except he puts it in our hands. And I, I want to say it this way. Everything the world needs, folks, we were given the means to make a difference. I don't know if you know this from history. An interesting little thing that happened. Very interesting. At the, at the end of 1940, so 1940, think of Hitler, think of the beginning of World War I or II. Um, so he had, uh, Hitler and his panzer divisions had just absolutely demolished the Dutch, the, the Belgians. Uh, they had come through France. If you know history, you know what happened is they were setting themselves up for the siege of Great Britain. So they were pushing to the, the French coast so that they could launch an assault on, uh, across the English Channel into, into Britain. What happened is, is thousands upon thousands of British soldiers were being pressed up against the shoreline where they were, they were stuck, they were trapped. The, the English uh, Navy had the means to take home uh, about 17,000 of them is all. That was all they could get off. There were over 300,000 of them. They could only rescue 17,000. Word got back to Britain in, into the, the halls of government in London. They said... <laughs> Brace yourself. Brace your, the, the phrase was, brace yourself for hard tidings. We're, we're going to hear some incredibly bad news. Our boys are going to get slaughtered. He's going to kill them. Uh, uh, he's going to pin them and kill them. Time's running. They're only a few miles away. And people like you and me got word. Our boys were at risk. They were in trouble. And history records this. In fact, let me just read. Uh, <clears throat> trawlers, tugs, fishing sloops, lifeboats, sailboats, pleasure craft, an island ferry named Gracie Fields, even the America's Cup Endeavor, all manned by civilian sailors, sped to the rescue. The ragtag armada eventually rescued 338,672 men and returned them safely to the shores of England. 
people like you and me, I got a boat? Yeah, I'll get involved, I'll jump in. There's a need? Yeah, we have all the resources we need. For the world, now I wanna close on this thought, for the ministry of this church. Everything we could ever need to do everything God ever asked of us, we have the resources to do. But we wrote our name on it. We called it ours. And we, to God. And he's like going, look, if I put that in your hands and you believe in me, you have got to understand that where that came from, I've got an endless supply of that. Whatever that is that you think you can't surrender to God. Everything you have is his. It's his, not yours, not mine. It's his. And when he asks to use it, you ought to think twice before you do this. Now listen, you start to realize God isn't interested in taking away your stuff. He put it in your hands. What's it doing to you? What's it doing to you? Well, we're going to continue this discussion. And you be sure to be a part of this. Let me pray and we'll wrap this one up. So God, help us because we all get greedy. We all get, we get sharpy crazy. We go psycho. And how it must disturb you when we write our name all over your stuff. Just like it would bother us deeply if any of us saw somebody else write their name on our whatever. And God, I pray that you just wake us up to this. Help us to understand that it's not by our good deeds that we were born here. It's not because we're so awesome that we, we were privileged in an incredible way to be born in a place with all the opportunities and all the incredible resources of this country. And somehow the only thing we can conclude is you willed that to happen. But God, what this has done to us can be far from what you intended for it to do to us. So I pray for us to be wise, to wake up, to open our eyes, to look around, to kind of smell the coffee on this one and realize that you are the source of all good things. And anything you have ever given us, if we gave it to you the way you intended, there would literally be an endless supply because it would only do the right thing, the good thing in us. God, teach us this. I pray for us in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you all.